Greetings from sunny South Florida. It's time for the Palm Beach Podcast. And the host of your show, sports chiropractor and athletic trainer, Dr. James Spencer. Photographer and art director, Mike Jones. Recorded live at the Media Zone Podcast Studio in Palm Beach County. Relax and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the Palm Beach Podcast. My name is Mike. I'm here with Dr. James Spencer and a very special guest today in Josh Cohen, a local here from West Palm Beach involved with ESPN Radio and lots of other great causes that we'll dig into today. Thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate you guys having me. I don't know how special of a guest, but I appreciate you having me anyway. I guess you can re-examine that at the end. Yes. How, how special you find me to be. We'll keep the judgment <laughs> uh, reserved till the end. Till the end. <laughs> but we can't thank you enough for coming into Media Zone and uh, you know leaving the beautiful studio that you have over at ESPN in West Palm appreciate Beach. It. Thank tell you. us, tell us a little bit about what you have going on. Well, I mean, you know, uh, we at ESPN West Palm have been in. Uh, you're referring to uh, the Phillips Point Towers. Um, which is obviously a beautiful, you know, skyline, majestic uh, structure that we're in. And to be honest with you, you know, ESPN West Palm is a marketing company that is ESPN 106.3 FM, um, Deportes 760 a mi, which means 760 AM sports radio. Also from there, we run the News Channel 5 and Fox 29 television sports departments. So it's our talent that produces and that anchors and reports on the television side. And then the digital for the ESPN app for ESPN.com. So all that happens in that beautiful waterfront ground floor of that tower. And I think the only reason we're in there is because the dude that runs the building is a fan. If he wasn't a fan, there's no way we could afford the rent. That's the convenience though. That's, I mean, it's like, <laughs> yes. Locals the, only. The, the doors that open as a result of people being a fan of our shows, uh, of the brand. I mean, you know, the ESPN brand stands, you know, speaks for itself, but we do have three live local shows in afternoon drive that come from just that studio and you know in the entire treasure coast and in west palm beach television radio markets nobody has three local shows it's 2020 i mean the last time these other stations had three live local shows was was a decade ago oh, wow yeah and is that because of the talent that you have or you know the ass kissing that you've done well i mean you know, <laughs> or ambition yeah i mean my personal talent you know is is off the charts obviously you guys have noticed this in the last 10 minutes it's not even quantifiable it's almost an embarrassment <laughs> of riches how talented i am say like as opposed to like you two i feel awful <laughs> that this is what you have to work with and i've got all i wish i could share some of it with no um uh, <laughs> The uh, no, the reality is, is that you know we have a great company. The parent company of ESPN West Palm is Good Karma Brands, GKB, and uh, Good Karma Brands is ESPN Cleveland, ESPN Milwaukee, ESPN Madison, ESPN West Palm, and we just acquired ESPN Chicago. So for ESPN globally, we're the biggest owner operator, believe it or not, of affiliates, and what they classify the best in class. So we out of right here at Flagler, you know, Drive or right there on the waterfront at Phillips Point Towers at our Anajar and Levine Studios. Um, <laughs> we have the ability to put local companies, um, brands, advertising, marketing on ESPN, the app on ESPN.com. So people watching the NBA finals or the college football national championship are seeing pre-roll that they can't fast forward um, or checking scores one per page, beautiful class layout of local bit, and they go, how in the world is that company on ESPN? Well, it's only in our area, but we have the ability to do that for the entire country. We're the only country, uh, excuse me, the only company within the ESPN family that can do that. That's incredible. So, so I would say it's it's not ass kissing as much as it is GKB's done a great job of that relationship with ESPN to uh, earn the trust, to be able to represent the brand and really be the, the best in class example, the, the teacher's pet. And, if you will. and who does that relationship building? Well, that would be, you know, the GKB founder and co-founder. Okay. That's Craig Karmazin, Steve Politziner, and, and even Evan Cohen, who also came on as talent. This is a, um, this is like a family owned operated business. Incredible. That is right. Uh, they just celebrated a 20th anniversary just last year. And you know, the culture, it's always culture. 
The culture is different. It's not a radio company. It's, it's a marketing company that happens to be in ESPN radio, ESPN digital, live events, the chair of Bunny Boca Raton Bowl. Yep. We operate that in a local yep. sense. Um, and even we have wireless stores in the Midwest. Um, and and, and it, so it all ties together in how does this fit? Well, the business model means that one, it's like the Disney model. Mm-hmm. One part serves the other and then everybody wins as a result. And, and how did you get into radio? But that's an interesting question. It was kind of a, not my plan, you know. Um, I uh, in college I studied mass communication, so that was television and a little bit of radio. But I really thought I was going to be Don Draper, Mad Men. I thought I was going to be the advertising guy that had the ideas for the campaign and the slogan, sure. and you know, in, in the marketing. And I was walking through the student union one day. And right before my senior year, I want to say, and this guy stopped me and he goes, you're the dude that hosts the parties. And I said, yeah. And he goes, and I've seen you doing the Jägermeister events at the bars. And I said, yeah, he goes, you got, cause I would MC these events. You're, like, you're welcome. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Did I give you a Jägermeister straw hat? Um, and so he said, we got a campus television station. It was legit. Like shortly after college, the, our campus station became the WB network, like the affiliate that would air the prime time. So it was legitimate. Like we had legitimate television capability, but I wasn't involved in that. I wasn't interested in that or interning at the radio station. And he said, we need an anchor for like sports center. It's called overtime. It's for the campus television. So it'd be covering college sports, but you being one of the sports center guys. And so he said, come in and test for it. And I thought, you know, I'm going to graduate college in here. I need something to do for a living. Sure. Probably not going to be hosting Jägermeister parties. (laughs) Shucks. For, uh, much forever, longer. <laughs> forever. As it turned out, that's actually how I made a living for the years following. But um, so, yeah, so we, I tried out and he goes, yeah, it's yours. So me and another kid, we were the sports center, if you will, anchors of this weekly uh, sports show for television called Overtime. And so then I thought, OK, I'm going to do television sports, which is what I did right out of college where I really kind of carved my own. I created my own role on an existing TV show in Philly. I kind of said, hey, what if I do this and add, and thank God that producer, God bless him, gave me a chance to do that a little bit while I earned a living hosting the Southern Comfort, Jack Daniels and Jägermeister events. Um, and then that led to me doing television a couple of years before I came down here by chance. And when I came down here by chance, I was hitting scan on the radio and I was on Hutchinson Island. And I heard terrible place, right? Terrible place. (laughs) And I heard these guys, the love doctors, and I didn't know what their show was supposed to be, but they were taking calls from weirdos and they, their sense of humor. Is that the Adam Carolla show? No, no, it was, it was Dr. Rich as in Rich Dickerson and Dr. Glenn is in Glenn Curtis and Dano, their producer. And it was unlike anything I'd ever heard before. And I said, this shit's crazy. And, and these dudes are crazy. And how did they get away with this on the radio? But it was fascinating. And long story short, I created a, a television show for here, a sports show for South Florida, the Treasure Coast. And I would listen to these love doctors every day. Um, they didn't know it. And one day I was driving into the TV station and somebody called in and asked them if they watched me on TV. And immediately my, my stomach dropped. Because I knew that the main dude was going to say, who? Like, <laughs> never heard of him. And the main dude, Dr. Rich said, yes, I love that guy. 7.30 at night. I have no idea what he's doing here, but he won't be here much longer. Meaning like he's too talented to be with. And I was blown away. And it was like the validation of these people are, this guy's vouching for me. Mm-hmm. So I subtly sent word back from one of our sales guys that let them know I'm a fan too. And then I went to one of their appearances and then I was a guest on their show. And long story short, April rolled around and the TV station didn't have money to continue to do the show. So that was over with. And they wanted me to come on their show because their audience used to watch. And I would put in subtle little Easter eggs in what I said to appease their audience. Right. That, so then they would call in and go, hey, did you I swear that was a reference to you guys? But I'd never admitted it because <laughs> I wanted to get their people to watch. And it worked. Yeah. Now, on cable, this little TV station was right between reruns of Seinfeld and uh, in Jeopardy. OK. So if you were flipping your, you know, Treasure Coast cable, you would have Seinfeld, you know, me in Jeopardy. So it was a great spot for half an hour, 730 to eight o'clock at night. 
And when that TV show was done, uh, they used to come in studio. I did a few hours with them. And, and this Dr. Rich guy, he said, uh, cause he was an institution, this cat. I'd been to their events. It would be a Thursday night in Jensen beach. They have 600 people. Oh shit. I mean, it was a phenomenon. It was, but it looked like, it looked like a sting operation. Sure. <laughs> I mean, it was like the dregs of society. It was, you know, the great unwashed is it was a different caliber of mankind, but it was like, these people are legit. What brought them together? Th- those guys or, or the fans the of the whole, show? All the above. Well, it, w- it was a society for the misfits. Okay. And it was a club. I mean, you you know, you could have the most conservative Republican call in. And then right after, there'd be a dude who was in the middle of gender reassignment. And then there would be a dude who came out when he was 13. And then there'd be a dude who'd call in from the Clan. Saying, I love the last caller. I love that too bad that he's a Jew or gay. And it was like, but it was this culture of, it was like, what in the world? And you know, this was the. That's, that's unique. Well, this was the late nineties, but I guess they started this in the, in the early nineties. This was like the, the, the birth of FM personality talk, anything goes. So when I left this, you know, I was about to leave the studio that day, you know, move on with my life. Dr. Rich said, give me a year. Don't go to Wichita. And I said, what's in Wichita? He goes, I'm saying, don't move far away. I want to work with you. And from the first time I ever heard these guys, that's all I ever wanted. And when I went to their events, that's all I wanted. You know, let's do this. So he said, give me a year. And so I did. And then 13th month came and he says, get in here. And and they convinced the general manager to flip the format to FM Hot Talk. And the general manager said, have a seat. And he said, "Uh, here's what we want to do. All talk, FM all day. Build around the love docs. Want you to do the afternoon, three to six p.m. And I said, I'm in. He said, He said, Do you hold on? Do you want to hear what it pays? And I said, Nope. Doesn't matter because this is what I wanted. He said, All right. So what are you making now? I told him. He says, All right. We'll give you X amount more. And I said, Good. That's great. And so that led to 13 years there before coming over to ESPN West Palm, which culture wise, I mean, you know, big difference. When when you when, when going to work every day, you're looking forward to it because you're going to see your people. When work never feels like work, when Monday always feels like Friday, I mean, you got the, you know, you got the world on a string. So the culture at ESPN West Palm, the people that I get to work with, teammates, not coworkers, um, do the show with, not for, is remarkable. I mean, I literally work in that building two hours, 15 minutes a day. And I almost wish there was an excuse for me to be there earlier so I could just kind of absorb that, that teamwork that makes a dream work. You know, it's special and unique that you say kind of work with, not for, right? Unique, yeah. unique verbiage I think is very special because there's, there's no predication that anybody's superior. Correct. We're all working together. Right. And that's really what we all want. When the tide rises, your boat rises, my boat rises, we all do. Yeah. And I think that's a special message that not enough people are pushing. Well, this company, you know, it's ESPN West Palm, but Good Karma Brands, parent company, they decided, you know, Craig Carmerson founded this. His father was a major player in radio. He ran CBS, Viacom. He was Howard Stern's boss. When Howard Stern was going to go to XM uh, Satellite Radio, from which was revolutionary. I was big. It was like he's also a Palm Beach local, correct? Who's that? Howard Stern. He live. He has a house on Palm Jupiter, Beach. Or, he has Jupiter, a house on, uh, on Palm Beach. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um. But Craig's dad is Mel Carmazin, who's like the godfather of the radio business, whatnot. And the dad said, "Listen, son, I'll give you all of my uh, knowledge and wisdom. You got to go do this on your own. You got to go." And he learned everything from his dad, and then from his own inquisitive ways. You know, there's certain people that you know why they're in power. They have a college football coach way about them or they're they're a little bit of a bully or they don't get a problem saying you're fired. You know, we got someone running the country. Some people believe it kind of got into power with that attitude. <laughs> Some people you spend time with and you know you got smarter. And and, and Craig Karma's in the founder of this company. You just know, like, if you spend 10 minutes, you're going to learn something. And he's not trying to teach you. You're just going to. He told me a story one time that when he was in high school, he had a job. You know, his father may have been very successful, but he had a job in high school. He worked at Sports Authority, you know, the sporting good chain. And so he was in 10th grade. He told me, he said, I was in 10th grade. And my mother said, okay, spring break's coming up. You know, where would you like to go? And he said, I want to go to Boynton Beach, Florida. And she goes, oh, sounds nice. What's there? <laughs> and he goes, the uh, Sports Authority corporate headquarters. Was it really? Yeah. 
And here's a tenth that age, tenth grade kid <laughs> who who wanted to go to Boynton Beach, you know, spring break. Yeah, let's go. But Boynton Beach, why? Because he wanted to go visit the sports authority headquarters. He said he wanted to see how it ran from the inside out. He wanted to see how the business operated. The irony of it is, is that I think they went out of business and then his company is blossoming, blooming and growing in an industry in which everyone is constricting. He observed the flaws. He, he observed the flaws, I guess. And, you know, also he's a high school kid who's OK. How does how does the business actually operate? But just to want to do that. You ask me when I'm in 10th grade, I want to go where are the girls with the biggest boobs. I want to go there. And then can I have my own room, mom? And then you you stay on the other end of the hotel. South Beach, not oh, Boynton was, Beach. Yeah, right? <laughs> right, right. What was your turning point? Because you mentioned that you had no interest in radio at, at the start. Yeah. Was it just the people that you were around or was it a certain show? No, no. It was, I mean, look, I was the kid on the playground that would do play by play during kickball. I was the kid in the car cruising in high school that would pretend to be the disc jockey. You know, when a song came on. You know, I would ramp it up like the DJ would. Partly cloudy, she has a shower's highs in the mid 70s, 74, and do that pukey fake DJ voice. I would sit with my boys in the fraternity house and we watch, you know, a football game. You couldn't hear the, the sound. So they'd be like, do it, do it, do the play by play guy. <laughs> be John I'm, Madden for a minute. And I'd be like, third and 10 from the 27, three receivers, top of the screen, in motion. Has a man open. Drop the ball to 17. Fourth down. My goodness, he dropped the ball. He sucks. Like the Bob Mennery thing, we were doing that 25 years ago. That's pretty damn good, bro. Well, thank you. <laughs> so experience. did you just not have the awareness that you were doing that your whole life? And well, I was a talker, shocker. I was uh, because it seems like you're a natural, right? The report card always said um, talks too much. Uh, it said distracts others from their learning. <laughs> it always said talks too much, distracts others from their learning, distraction, whatever. And then you know, senior year, you get most talkative you know, the class clown stuff. So I was always doing that. I just thought that I was going to be the advertise, the Don Draper Mad Men. I don't know if you guys watch the show, yeah. but the one that said, this is the slogan. This is the pitch. This is the look and, and whatnot. Um, but then I would host, you know, those events when I was in college for Jägermeister and Jack Daniels and be on the mic and clown in his bikini contest. And then for the fraternity, same thing in the basement of our house. So it was obvious I was going to make a living in some kind of broadcast. I didn't want to do radio. I was going to do the television sports to tell the story, the feature story, make you cry, make you think, make you feel, uh, make you laugh. Not necessarily sit there and go, let's pick up the highlights in the third quarter. Uh, Steelers have a touch. Like, psh, I'm right, bored. Right. When I heard these dudes doing whatever it was they were doing, the first thing I thought was, do they know their mics are on? <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> and so then I knew, like, that's what I should be doing. And so I started doing it. And 20, almost one year, 20, we celebrated 20th anniversary of my show on September 13th. Congrats, man. So thank you very can much. You, can you plug Appreciate it for us? It. Plug Josh Cohen and the home team on ESPN 106.3 FM and also worldwide on the free ESPN app. People listen around the world. I have no idea why, because uh, you have to have better options, but on the ESPN app, 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern time. But that is also um, 9 p.m. in the south of France. I come to learn. Okay. Because it's six hours later. That's when I listen to it. You're well traveled. <laughs> I, shockingly, once in a while, yeah. So, yeah, I kind of heard this format thing. And once I started doing it, I go, why would you want to do anything else? You know, why would you want to do anything? If you could be in a position where you could tell people how you really felt, but you could also screw around and joke, but you could help people, mm -hmm. there would be a woman who called in who needed to borrow $30. So she could buy a bus ticket to bury her husband's ashes in Saginaw, Michigan. And the phone lines light up with blue collar working class dudes. $30 to them means that this week they can't take their kids, their family to dinner, but they were gonna. And they said to the kids, well, I'm gonna explain it to them. And 50 of those call and say, forget the plane. Can we, uh, the bus, can we put you on a plane? Is there anything that you need? Can I mow your lawn for you? I mean, that's the goodness of the people. So when I started that, I go, this is where I need to be. This is what I need to be doing. And thank God ESPN West Palm understands that we are live, local, community, live here, work here, play here, and that there's a charity event. There's a charitable cause. Someone's in need. You know, I've been on the air with people that were going to kill themselves. I've been on the air with people that confessed to murder. I've been on the air with people that 
confess to doing horrible things to others, having horrible things done to them that needed an outlet, that needed someone to talk them off the ledge, that needed advice. Do I take my mother off a of life support? Do I abort this pregnancy? Do I end this engagement, this marriage? So you're in a position where you better be compassionate and you better be unbiased and fair. And, and you better be very serious with these folks to explain, this is just my opinion. It may not be what you want to hear, but it's probably what you need to hear, at least from my perspective. I think you hit the nail on the head on the unbiased. He really took the words out of my mouth because that's something there's no, there's no judgment there. Like you said, it's your opinion versus a medical provider or anybody else, yeah. right? Any counselor or anything like that. And, and, and providing something uh, of value without judgment is huge for a lot of people nowadays. You know, my father, God rest his soul, he passed on his 46th birthday. He raised three kids, my two older sisters and me, single parent, three kids, Incredible, working all day. Man. Yep. And, and volunteer with this organization, volunteer with that organization, with this charity. And, you know, he got bad cards, you know, he got pancreatic cancer and got sick, didn't get better. And that's the last time I lived with a parent in the household, um, as life would have it. But, you know, I spent enough time with him. I learned compassion and also he was self-made, self-paid, overcame all the obstacles that he had to, to get to college, to finish college, to go to law school, to work three jobs, to figure it out. And he became, he wanted to be a judge. He believed, he became a lawyer and then he wanted to be a judge. He believed in fairness. He believed in the law. He thought that it, things weren't fair for some people because of their house was on the other side of those railroad tracks. Or there was one less digit in their paycheck each week or two weeks or whatnot. So he believed in the law and, and, and he believed in, in, in fairness. And I think I inherited from my dad the ability to remove your own personal feelings, your own wants and wishes and just unbiased see things as they truly are, which is why I think I get asked so often for advice because they know like... I've been friends with a couple, a he and a she, and, the, and they're both bitching to me about he said she and he's wrong. And I go, you may not want to hear this, but she's right. Or you may, he's right because I have the ability, right? to. And so people say, well, what about football? Who's your team? I bet on football. I don't have a team. You know, <laughs> You're a smart man. Like, like <laughs> I, I, you know, two weeks ago I had Monday night, I had the Browns just to beat the Jets. But then Sunday night, they were in prime time. I had the Rams to beat the Browns. So I loved them on Monday. Six days later, I hate them. I hope everybody gets hurt and I hope they get blown out because <laughs> I don't want to sweat. It. I want to get paid. So I think all of us can learn to remove and separate what we want it to be with what we believe it to be. So you'll claim no team. No. You have no, no, no team. No. No, 32 teams. Players, not plays? Um, no, I mean, there are certain personalities that I like. Absolutely. But but I'm able to, there are personalities I don't like, but their talent's undeniable. Correct. Be a great player, and I think an awful dude. And then there's, you know, great dudes, and I'm like, eh. Like, on the air, I got asked about a quarterback who's from the area, you know, and I said, I love this kid. Every time I see him, he's polite. He always comes over. He's very respectful. He doesn't need to be. He's an NFL starting quarterback, but he always, you know, is very considerate to me and very, you know, polite i don't think he's got you know the top elite stuff to be an nfl starting quarterback that's hard to say you know i was judge judy before judge judy you know i was doing sure, this sure. In, in middle school like the, not everybody appreciates honesty not you know sometimes a girl says you know does this outfit make my butt look you know and i and yeah and then they're like upset when you ask me well and i'm I giving think, it to you i think you you kind of remind me maybe he mimics you but colin coward is very similar isn't not he really yeah, he's just like unapologetically Colin, isn't he? Yeah. Colin is a super smart guy. Colin is the king of the analogy. I think he spends a lot of time equating how can I put this into common terms? Because related, I mean, if you're going to be in broadcasting, you got to be relatable, compelling, entertaining. It's some. Colin good, wants. What to, about good looking? I mean, obviously. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we all. <laughs> that works in, you know, magazine ads. And in 30 second, you know, <laughs> beer commercials for females and for males, you know, cologne and sure. whatnot. You talk about the polo community, right? Nacho Figueres. S stud polo player. 30 seconds on, you know, commercials for polo blue. I think he was blue. Blue. 
it's funny because then he got replaced, and the new uh, face is another guy that I know, Luke Rockhold, who's a UFC fighter, former yep. light heavyweight champion in the world, who was um, not confident at all when it comes to the ladies. I'm sure he is and, now. That's yeah, terrible. You know, he's always been. <laughs> I was standing with Luke Rockhold um, during UFC International Fight Weekend in the Cosmopolitan. He had a little appearance in a lounge, and he literally, there'd be a girl walking with her guy. I mean, her husband or her boyfriend, like walking together, and he would say, "Hey, what's up? How are you?" And the guy's like, "Oh my god, like, dude, I'm standing right." He did not care. <laughs> Shout out Luke Rockhold. Who, hey Luke, come on the podcast who, sometime, oh, will you, please. We have questions. He'd love to. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, I Asking got for a, a friend. I got off uh, base with where we started, but you. So obviously, you kind of saw a path for yourself going into media production. Here at Media Zone, we've done our research and we've learned that you're actually quite a sunset photographer. Oh yeah! You want to talk a little bit about your uh, yeah? I got a your, balcony. Your newfound skills. I got a I got a balcony that overlooks the uh, the west, and I have an unobstructed view over the the lake, over Clear Lake. So I take lots of sunset pictures. Love it. So that uh, young women have an excuse to want to come over and say, "Hey, um, well, how come you don't invite me over for a sunset? I'll bring the white claw." Strategic marketing. <laughs> you know they have white claw on Brightline now. Did you know, you know that? when you said you had connections 20 years ago, we were kind of hoping that Jägermeister had ended up buying White Claw, Ooh. you know, because we're looking for New you know, sponsor. that first sponsor of, uh, of the Palm Beach podcast. White Claw, you might have to knock on that door and let them know that your guests are subject to. They, uh, they serve it on Brightline now. They do. In the select lounge, it's complimentary. And then in the select car, it's complimentary, of course. But if you're going to take Brightline, which... Why would you drive to Miami? No, Why would you drive no to Fort Lauderdale? No, no. Brightline is like, getting there is half the fun, as I say. But you, the one thing you should do if you take Brightline is always use promo code ESPN ah. because you'll save up to 25% off. So I, I, what I want to do is I want to punish Brightline for being <laughs> uh, generous and make them hurt financially for being so kind to give us a promo code. Yeah, just punch in ESPN, hit apply, and 25% off savings, and then they'll regret their decision, but that's okay. There's going to be a lot of people applying that code. Now, I hope so. You're overcrowding the public transport. Well, I don't know. I, I, th <laughs> I, th I think Brightline would be happy. Correct. To, yeah, I, listen, I take it every week. I'll, I'll, do a, I'll do a daycation to Fort Lauderdale. I'll jump on the train 6.30 Friday night, and then I'll go stay down Fort Lauderdale Beach, and I'll come back Saturday afternoon. Or maybe go to Miami Saturday and then exactly. come back up Sunday. Back. Yeah, yeah. Brightline is the best. I mean, it's game changer. Game I, changer. I have one more question from my Instagram research that I've done. Sure. You got to tell me about Ghetto Kitchen. Oh, oh. that was a, <laughs> yeah. Ghetto Kitchen was a, was a big deal on Snapchat. Ghetto Kitchen was um, <laughs> problematic because. Problematic. <laughs> so, so Ghetto Kitchen was a concept right that back. I had um, on. Um, do I keep talking now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, keep going. Okay, good. Uh, Ghetto Kitchen was a thing that I did on Snapchat, where I would work with what I had, resourcefulness, we talked about. So if I had a can of old, um, can of old meat. Oh, he, what, you, you, you stopped the podcast to go get White Claws? I said BRB. You was can this, continue. Was this raspberry for me? Or would you like one? Would you well, like yeah. one? You can join um, in the party. You know yeah, what? Yeah, you raspberry. know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have one. There you I'm going to have one. And then we'll get back to a uh, ghetto kitchen. <laughs> I want to have your full attention for this. I appreciate that. Yeah, since you know you're the one asking, um, would you rather have the, the the raspberry or the black cherry? You pick your poison. Yes. Yeah. You know what? I, I got a I got a fridge full of black cherries. Perfect. So okay. We'll, we'll mix them up. Mix them up. Okay. There we go. Just, you know, just, Cheers, boys. just three dudes drinking uh, seltzer water mm. on a, on a podcast. That's Palm Beach in a nutshell. Mm. Oh, that's delightful. So, um, Kettle Kitchen. So yeah, I mean the principle is real simple. I'm going to be a jackass in the kitchen of my condo <laughs> and on Snapchat, I'm going to like take a handful of old stale mini marshmallows, put them in a bowl, two fingers full of butter. That looks about right. Put it in the microwave, a filthy microwave. That Micro looks about right. That looks about right. I go, eh, that's probably about as much butter as you need. And then microwave it for, you know, 20 seconds and then take, you know, store brand generic Rice Krispies, pour them in, mix it up and be like Rice Krispie treats, ghetto kitchen, bam. And, then I would make, you know, I would have old tortillas that didn't get used and there'd be a can of like random barbecued beef. I don't even know if they canned it, but it had the sticker on it from Target where it was on clearance. So obviously- One of those hurricane specials. Probably. But, but you, you know, I don't know about you guys, but you know, if you're going to eat, you know, canned meat, you obviously want it to have the clearance sticker on it Correct. to prove that it's really old. Much better. Man. So, I, so I would make like a, like a microwave, 
barbecued beef quesadilla out of that, but I didn't have, you know, real cheese. So I take it like string cheese and like tear it apart. And, and it got a, this cult following where I would go to, I would be at concerts. You know, I've been on the air a long time and I've done a lot of live events. I've been on stage at Sunfest. I've been on, you know, hosting the after parties in Honda Classic. Yeah. You know, so it's, you know, some folks recognize you. You're the sure. guy from. Bro, I would be going to concerts at Coral Sky Amphitheater and young dudes, like 19, 20 year old dudes, like, yo, JC, big fan. And I would say, yo, I appreciate that. And I said, you listen to the show? They go, what show? <laughs> and I go, how do you? And they go, ghetto kitchen, dude. And I said, oh, like when, when people are like wrecking or appreciating your work because you're eating things you shouldn't be eating. True art. And, and cooking things how you shouldn't be cooking. Um, then you know that maybe you need to shut it down for a little bit. <laughs> I, I stopped using Snapchat. So I, I promised Instagram I was going to bring it back. But then I don't have the, you know, I'm kind of inspired sometimes. I'm not inspired to do it. It's a creative it's a creative yeah, process. Yeah, oh yeah. It's all improv too. I can oh, yeah. tell. Yeah, yeah. But then, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't like that take. And I got to do a second take of like, because I would say like, this is, I'm going to be throwing up till 4 a.m. for sure. <laughs> and, you know, some of that, but then I would get, you know, I would get messages from, from people that I respect their opinion of that follow me on Snapchat. I would get, and they would say, if you eat that, you're probably going to die. Or you don't really <laughs> eat this shit, do you? And I mean, world-class athletes. Like, one of my Snapchat friend followers is was a friend in real life who was like the greatest of she's the greatest of all time at what she does in the history of sports. Sure. And anytime there was go to kitchen, I knew because you get a little message and kid, it was going to be that the emoji that's puking and like you're going to die. Why do you do this to yourself? <laughs> this is why no one respects you. <laughs> Whatever the case was. But the ghetto kitchen was what do I got to work with? Let's create a dish out of it. And then people, you know what? I got to bring it back. You got to, bro. I do, yeah. I got I got to find the inspiration, though. It's kind of like the Counting Crows. You know, they don't want to play Mr. Jones again. You know, so yeah. they come to Sunfest, and you're like, play Mr. Jones, and they don't play it, and then you're pissed. People are pissed because they're like, where's my ghetto kitchen? Yeah, I know. I've, I've only recently learned about this because Spence said that you were a possibility to come on the show. Yeah. So I do my due diligence and, you know, do a little bit of background but you research. But you didn't see any, right? Well, so... um. I absolutely did see a ghetto kitchen <laughs> right right after around the hurricane time. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. There was yeah. some ghetto kitchen probably happening the beef. around. Um, yeah, what? What? It was start of the September. I think there was a good episode. Oh, but I, I, no, I was just trying out like new flavors of things. You were bringing it back, I think. <laughs> but I wasn't cooking elaborate, testing the market, if you will. You're right, right. But it was like um, these stadium flavored tortilla chips. They're supposed to taste like stadium nachos. Ah. Uh. And I remember, yeah, but I didn't like create a dish with it. I just sampled it. And I remember like, Ooh, this tastes like, you know, nachos and, and, and tortillas and grandpa's cremated ashes or something. It had like the flavor, a little bit of if grandpa got incinerated, you definitely got to bring this back. Yeah. We'll bring back the you know, Josh corn radio is all one word from my social media platforms. And occasionally I'll get a message. Where's ghetto kitchen, but I got to get inspired again. And speaking of eating, uh, last week we had Jupiter Donuts on the show, and Spence was discussing the possibility of a donut eating contest. And before we went live today, we talked to you about possibly being an MC or involving ESPN somehow. Yeah, I would love to. And you're you're going to have a local charity involved. Correct. And you're talking about Roger Dean Stadium, Roger Correct. Dean Chevrolet Stadium. Correct. A great partner of ours at ESPN West Palm, of course, spring training for the uh, Marlins and for the Cardinals and Florida State League ball. I just did their home run derby for All Star Weekend. That's Mike Bauer and company. So yeah, you get together your your donut eating uh, contest, your spring training, um, with you know a charity involved, and I would love to participate. Perfect, we'd love to. We look forward to it. I'm sure Ju Jupiter Donuts would hate to be a part of it. Yeah, I imagine Jupiter Donuts would hate all that publicity, promotion, <laughs> and front of mind thinking of, boy, Jupiter Donuts. In fact, you know what? I'm going to add, we're going to add a ghetto kitchen aspect to it called oh, Ghetto no Donut. No way. And that I'm going to ask people huge. to create their own variety. Oh. So we're going to have celebrity judges now. Now we're talking. And it's baby. like, you bring me. So the base is, <laughs> base is you got to get, you know, a base cake or whatever donut from them. Correct. And then you add whatever to it. You Ghetto can toppings. You can you can inject it with jello shots. This could be a this could be a cooking Frosting. show. Well it's it's ghetto donuts. Is a <laughs> courtesy of Ghetto Kitchen at your donut eating competition. 
I love it. You're a legend. That sounds like a great collaboration. <laughs> and and we talked about this before we went on live as well as creating symbiotic relationships with people in the community. And it's just it it comes so naturally. Like this is why I like sitting in Media Zone and having these types of podcasts. It's because ideas like this come out of nowhere, and it's just look, man. We live in paradise. We do. And there's a lot of good vibes. People are happy. The weather's good, right? If you're in a position that you could introduce someone to someone for their mutual benefit and gain, then you should. If you can do something to help make someone's life a little better, your day a little better, a little easier, then why wouldn't you? What's the point of having platforms, contacts, resources, if you're not going to share that for the betterment of others? What's the point of any of this? Well, you know, truthfully, that's kind of how I look at my business. A lot of people come in to see me with injuries and whatnot, and, and a lot of times I'm just their only hour of positivity. Spiritually, and, not just in yeah, physical manipulation. No, totally, totally. And, and if I can be that resource for them, I don't care what kind of value I'm providing. That's priceless for them. Yeah, that's so, great. So I appreciate that, and that's really what Palm Beach Podcast gravitated really onto your content is, is the way you're giving back and the way that you're spreading the positive message. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. No, that's that's something that we want to help promote, and, and that's really why we had you on here. The, the reason that I, I got for 20 years to play the a-hole of radio is, well, first of all, I, I had a choice to make. When we were going to do this home team show in the afternoon drive following those legendary love doctors, they were doing their thing. If I tried to do what they were doing, wouldn't work. No. And then the audience was waiting to eat you alive anyway. And the audience was kind of skeptical. They were kind of rooting against you. They didn't know who you were. It was just a, a, a New York kind of sounding college boy, <laughs> by the way, college educated, that, you know, was a wise ass that had a Jewish sounding name and was probably, you know, so already there's a built in hurdles to cross. I decided I was going to be the bad guy. I'm going to be the sarcastic button pushing little brother a hole of radio because it is funny to the masses totally and it's engaging entertaining memorable relatable but when it comes time to show that true empathy that true understanding um people see through if, if you're an a-hole who pretends to be good like good morning and welcome to news channel five it's uh 4 30 a.m but you're an a-hole in real life you can tell yeah and most people, most, not all, but most of the audience and most of my fans and listeners through the years, um, when I meet them, they'll say, you know, like for the most part, like, yo, dude, you're a good dude. I can tell some say you're a lot nicer than I thought you were going to be. Very rarely is it a case of, um, you know, like, yeah, you, you're great on the air, but you're a dick in person. That's ne if never, that's, ever, I don't think in 20 years that have been the case. If, if your heart is true and people know that you honestly legitimately care and you want to do for others and you want to help for others and you give a shit, then they see through you playing the a-hole. They get locked back in it and they go, man, you make me crazy. I swear to God, I want to punch the radio sometimes. I want to And they go, but I know you're actually a decent dude. You're just playing the bad cop. Playing, playing the bad guy. You play the bad guy long enough though people, you know, I mean, look, you know, I was on the air the morning of 9-11. I was with a huge audience listening from Orlando to Cocoa Beach to Fort Lauderdale. And the iPod didn't come out till a month later. There was no satellite radio. There was no smartphones. You had AM, FM, CDs. And we had an enormous audience at, you know, 857 when it was an accident. And then at 903, this is on purpose. And now I've got to give play-by-play -play on World War Three, which, by the way, is happening in you know lower manhattan and then in dc for an hour 35 uninterrupted as september approaches it's amazing on facebook people come out of the woodwork to say i, I was listening that morning you talked to me through you gave me the information you told me my daughter was dead you told me i'd never see my son again you told me my best friend was gone like some people in news probably want to that role I don't, you guys have had to give people bad news before imagine doing it on a scale of That's tens and tens of thousands with all that uncertainty. I don't want that role, that job. But for those that were there then, and then all of our efforts in the, in the months that followed, what they recognized was that we all were shocked and horrified and heartbroken together. And, and all I was, was the guy that had to tell you, here's what is happening. Here's what we know. 
and we're all going to get through this together. Thank God I had a background in psychology, um, you know, because I don't know if any of this, you know, career of mine would have been possible. Because really, I'm 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 doing psychology and human behavior with a little bit of entertainment and a little bit of sports now. Did it's that help, conversation, right? Yeah. Did that help verbalize your context? What, as, as far as on, like on on nine eleven is. Um, the way that you worded certain things, not to make it so abrupt, or were you just? It was. It was. Hey, this is black and white. It was. Hey, how does a newsman sound? It was. How does Tom Brokaw speak? Sure. Because when it seemed like an accident at the North Tower, you know, we were just busting balls and screwing off. But then when we watched the second plane hit the South Tower, literally, you can hear my speech go from, "What does he know? That guy's a, he's an idiot. He's a momo." Go from that. Into, as we understand it, United Flight 93, uh, American Airlines Flight 1177, the airports of origin, Logan, uh, Newark, and also uh, in the destinations, Los Angeles, San Francisco. You can hear me becoming like a formal newsman, speaking slowly with cadence. At this hour, if you're just joining us, there is a deliberate attack upon America both towers of the World Trade Center have been hit with large commercial aircraft, and we are trying to lock down flight information to put some of you at ease. We're going to go to the phones. Mike, you're in New Jersey. You're witnessing this live. Mike, what did you see? Sure. And now you're, I'm getting goosebumps because all that comes back. And then there's people who are jumping to their death. And you're having to explain, you know, my producer called out sick that day. My phone screener was filling producer. My intern was filling phone screener. And nobody knows this when it's live. But to bring it back full circle, some people want the job of the news of breaking news. Nobody wants that job. Nobody, nobody, I don't, and I'm haunted every year by the people that message me or I go to a concert at Coral Sky and they go, hey man, I just want to let you know what a great job you did that day and the days and weeks and months that followed. And, um, you know, my, uh, my nephew or my niece or my sister or my brother, was on 11 or 77 or was in the North Tower, South Tower, Cantor Fitzgerald, whatever. There's a lot of people in Palm Beach County that have migrated south. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I've only lived here for years. Spence has been here for a little bit longer than that. And so I'm still learning about the area and the people that live here. And I didn't know there were so many Patriots fans down here, number one. Yeah. <laughs> but number two, it's, you know, it's a desirable place to live. It's and paradise. a lot of people come down, whether they're a snowbird or not. Yeah. And, um, you know... My number one example is I walked home with a pizza box one day when I first moved here mm -hmm. and my neighbor is a retired firefighter from New York City. Yeah. And he told me that was the wrong box of pizza to be bringing home. It's the wrong place because <laughs> he knew he knew New York pizza. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, so ESPN West Palm, you think, all right, well, you know, West Palm Beach isn't really a, a sports town. Well, of course it is because everyone that lives in the Treasure Coast Palm Beach is sports fans. It just may not be. The, t the team like in Boston or the team in Chicago or the team in Dallas, what you realize is these people care every bit as much. It's just about the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Phillies, the Mets, the Giants, the Jets, the Patriots, the Knicks, the, you know, the Celtics, the it's where this market is a, is a microcosm for the nation. Correct. So our topics and conversation you know, for my show and for the station are very national, very what moves that needle up here. Because if we got into a thing about the Miami Dolphins and what they need on the <laughs> offensive just line. Bring this up. Right. But even if even if the Dolphins were good, <laughs> even if the Dolphins are good, it, the majority of the audience cares about a team other than. Correct. Because if you add up the Cowboy fans, the Giants fans, you know, the Saints fans, all those, you got 31 others versus your one. Now, in Boston, they want to hear Patriot, Patriot and the Patriot opponent. But here they want to hear about their teams. So we figured that out when they set up shop for ESPN, then 760, which became ESPN West Palm and 106.3 is everything grew and grew and grew. It, West Palm Beach was the biggest um, television radio market in the country that didn't have a sports radio station. So that's why Craig Carmazin and Steve Polzinger chose West Palm Beach. That's the biggest market. Wow. And further south that doesn't have sports radio. So we're going to change that. It's almost to the benefit that there's not like a team right here, Absolutely. like majorly. You know, it's like an hour that way, an hour that way, an hour that way. And so you guys can kind of play ball with all the markets. Well, I mean, again, the people that live in the Treasure Coast and the Palm Beaches, let's take West Palm Beach, for example. Sure. You know, Wellington through. 
odds are good they, they you know they came from somewhere other than you know there's a lot of natives and we must never forget that we're just guests you know if, if you were born and raised here and your parents were it's like that scene in casino when um uh, Robert De Niro was being reminded that, you know, y'all are just a guest here, mm-hmm. you know, and because the one dude he wanted to fire, he's an idiot, he was incompetent, run the machines, but he was a nephew of a commissioner and he says, fire him. I don't care. He's incompetent, stupid. And he said, y'all got to remember, you know, you're just our guests here. You know, if these Florida natives, we're their guests. So when they say, you know, if you love New York so much, because I hate when people complain. Sure. They go, oh, no, no. Yeah. It's like, you know, 95 North is right there. Right. So if Philly's so much greater. If Jersey's so much greater, New York, just go. The pumpkin spice is there, the same up right, there. Right, right, yeah. There's, there's a reason why you're here, right? But never forget whose house you're in. You know, the, those Florida crackers, which is not a derogatory term, that was the term. This is theirs, right? Back the original folk that came to build the railroad. So sometimes you meet people who are, you know, fourth generation. You're like, four, is that even possible? Sure. Math-wise, you know, it, 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 and they're out in Jupiter Farms, whatnot, and they're like, hey, man, you say, all right, you know, this is your house. You know, this is your house. I'm just a guest. But uh, no, this is paradise. I could have gone to New York. I could have gone to L.A. I could have gone to Dallas. I had these offers, opportunities. People go, career-wise, you ever want to say, no, career-wise, nothing. I do what I want, where I want, when I want, with who I want. Who could ask for more? You know? And there's a lot of professional athletes that live in the area as well, so it probably works really well for working for ESPN and being surrounded by, you know, sure. I mean, a plethora of talent. Yeah. I mean, but, it, but I think more so it tells you on a personal level, if these people have the means and the wherewithal to live wherever they choose and this is where they choose to be, then you, then if you're also choosing it, you're doing something, you're right. doing something right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, it doesn't matter what spectrum of sports, baseball, football, basketball, golf, it's all around here course you know and and that's what's really cool just for our diversity as far as working with different athletes and we'll throw equestrian into the mix as well listen wellington is the winter equestrian capital of the world the greatest polo players in the world are in wellington from january through april the greatest high goal polo the world polo league is happening um you know the longines masters is happening in wellington these are the best riders jumpers polo players in the world yep. you know argentina through the super bowl sunday i was in atlanta for friday saturday for the parties and whatnot and uh, steve Poltina and craig carmison shout out again they were nice <laughs> enough to get me in on the wheels up party which Perfect. is the, with the party you want to be at but then you leave sunday morning get out of there before the game and i had an appearance so i'm in atlanta sunday morning and Sunday lunchtime, I'm Wellington. back in. I, I went right from the airport, got changed in the A one A A one A limo. Shout out in the town car on my way to Wellington to the Palm Beach Masters for the show jump. And literally, it's like these are the best riders. That you forget like Super Bowls happening in Atlanta. Correct. And it's all the celebrities and whatnot. And so I'm standing there because I had a little brunch time appearance at you know the show jump for the for the Longines uh, Masters, and um, they do such a great job with that. Katie is incredible. Number, they do a great job. And so this uh, old gentleman, that someone says, uh, this is Bob. He says, who do you like today? Who do, I, who do you like today, Mr. ESPN? And I said, I like the Rams, to be honest. He goes, I do too. He goes, I do too. He goes, I think I'm going to take the points. And I said, yeah, I do too. And it was Robert Duvall. And I was like, wait, this Tom <laughs> Hayden from The Godfather, the great Santini, like one of the greatest actors, you know, in the history of the craft. Did you give him some bad gambling advice just, that and, day? And he and I Hopefully both. Hopefully not. Yeah, no, no. He and, I, he and I both. I said, I can I be honest. I kind of like the Rams in this matchup. And he said, I do too. I'm glad to hear you said. So we both lost money on a Super Bowl Sunday. And it was a boring running. Super Bowl too. It was the worst. Terrible. The first half was like. Yeah, no, it was the worst. It was, uh, it was one touchdown score. Yeah. But just that final touchdown by the. And the Rams were like the second team ever to not score a touchdown. Correct. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was an awful game. The point I was making was equestrian capital of the world you know there's robert duvall and the best jumpers and his wife and they're involved in that yeah. world and then you know mark and melissa gansey in the world polo league and what they do you know with bringing the best high goal players in the world you know to wellington to play in the world polo league it's just the second season of that now but man i mean the integrity of that game you know for the world to see they're doing it right you know they're not throwing a you know a cocktail party with you know signed mm-hmm. kind of okay mm-hmm. polo it's the love of the game it's the best of the, the best. best of the best yeah, so yeah, it yeah. is so the best golfers in the world live in a seven mile radius jupiter island gardens right there correct you know 
That's Ricky and Dustin and Rory and Tiger and Brooks. They're right, 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 right there. Right. And then, you know, Venus and Serena or gardens right here. Away. And, you know, Naomi Osaka and Boca and, uh, you know, so on. This, you know, throw Coco into the mix there too. Coco's boy. I, I met Coco, you know, she and her daddy became friends of mine three years ago because she goes to school at my friend Patrick Maratagu's Academy okay. in the South of France. Yeah. And I MC the gala every year for the foundation, the champ seed foundation. Coco is a champ seed dur, meaning a champ seed kid, meaning that people um, donated money so she could go to school there. So she could have the best coaching and the best schooling. And then she goes this year to Wimbledon and she beats Venus. And it's like, people don't know how much Venus and Serena mean (laughs) to her. So I know this little yeah. girl. She's 12, Full three years circle. ago. We flew back from France Full together. Full circle. You know, her daddy, Corey, she's Corey also. She's Corey like Junior, if you will. Coco's the nickname. Okay. So they don't get confused in the house. But um, man, like, yeah. Like, there's an example of, of a local kid. And, and you know. And who, even, I don't, I don't even mean to cut you off there, but even the Williams girls paying it back to her. Right? And, and giving her the respect that she deserves. L- listen, um. You know, Venus and Serena are, are friends of mine. And we used to be a lot closer a few years ago. Um, my One of my best buddies was, was dating Venus for a couple of years. And then I knew, you know, Serena and I would, would often be like the extra, extra. Sure. And we became friends. And sure. she, she'd be someone on, on Snapchat that would also say, um, this is why no one uh, respects you. Because you <laughs> eat things like, why do you eat this? But she's a secret fan of Ghetto Kitchen. Yeah, it wasn't no one in a secret. No, she was a huge, <laughs> no Serena was a huge, huge fan. <laughs> Serena was a huge fan of Ghetto Kitchen once upon a time. But um, you know, those girls, people, if they don't realize their story, you know, tennis is a country club once upon a time, very country club, very wealthy, very white, very suburban country sport. And these girls are legitimately from Compton, California where their dad said, listen, we're all going to have a better life and you guys are going to earn it for yourself and you're going to change the world in the process and you're going to inspire and motivate others with their own. Cause you know, where you grow up, you know, and who, what, and who you're surrounded by, you put limitations around yourself because nobody gets to do that. Correct. They were cleaning off syringes and broken glass and whatnot off the tennis courts before then they would go and hit. Imagine, you know, it's one thing if you're playing a sport, that most people feel welcome and included with. That that was not the case. There was a Thea Gibson and there was Arthur Ashe. And then, Mm -hmm. okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. So imagine how many times, you know, Richard Williams, God bless him, was at a a tennis court, was at a park, was at a country club. And someone said to him, excuse me, sir, can I help you? Mm. And he said, no, I'm all set. And they said, is there something we can help you with? He said, no, no, I'm, I'm all good. And they go, sir, um, in, assuming why is there why is there a black you have to be real why is there a black man and he's i'm waiting for my daughter's oh the oh hey element the oh you are uh. and i've been to the u.s open many times luck you know gratefully as a guest of both of those young ladies and when they're playing a match you see people coming in to sit down to watch the match that never felt welcome to the game that never felt included That's in special. the game. It is special. And you see little boys and little girls, and you see folks that are coming straight from where it's the US Open and it's Navy Blue Blazers and Wall Street. And it's the financial, and it's Tony Bennett sits over there and Alec Baldwin sits over there. And I was there, and Oprah and Gail were over here, and Trump was not even running for president. It was summer of 2015, <laughs> and he was there getting the loudest boos of anyone that I've ever heard in the stadium. He must have fired everyone. And uh, he was the apprentice guy. But <laughs> but there are people coming from working class, blue collar, sure. or civil servant jobs that had to be there for the match. And they're wearing uh, whatever their work clothes are. And these are persons of color from the beginning to the end of the spectrum that, love that, that are there because I, and, and because they are feeling a connection to these two girls that came from a situation where playing this game, let alone dominating it and changing it, changing the game. And I'll just mean who watches and who attends, but the game, the power game, the women's power game, the watch what women's tennis, the speed of the ball and serves and whatnot prior to. And then after these two showed up, 
it's it's worlds apart. But you get this feeling, you know, there was a Tiger Woods effect because whether it should be the case or not, we relate to people that are from where we're from, where we're from, what we're from, that sure. look like us. And, you know, Tiger, who is part Caucasian, Asian, and African-American, Kabbalan Asian, I think is a term that he used, all things to all people, because he was this melting pot. But in America, if you're part black, you're black. Yeah. Lenny Kravitz's father was a white Jewish Russian. And his mother, who was uh, on the Jeffersons, remember his mom, oh, yeah, Roxy yeah. Roker, yeah. said, told him when he was a little boy, you know, he said, my mom told me, you know, I'm black, so you are. No one speaks of Barack Obama being America's first biracial sure. president. Sure. His mother was white as snow. This white woman from Kansas whose skin was translucent. That's a good point. But we view, that's what America does, to see the, the Venus and Serena Williams effect. Um, and for people to feel, little boys, little girls, all the way through 100 years old, you see people that are emotionally moved because it's like, we belong, we can do this too. It makes it real when somebody that's relatable to you is in such a spot and whether relatability is color, like that's still relatability. It can, it you can, know? It, look at how many small towns have you been in where some local kid made it to the NFL and maybe Bell Glade, right? Okay. But, but, <laughs> right. But right. But, but take a small town outside of um, Philadelphia. Okay. <laughs> where, where it's Eagles country and some kid made it to the Detroit lions. Everyone's wearing Lions gear. Sure, sure, sure. Lions flags on their front porches and whatnot. Because one of theirs, the nationalism that we feel during the Olympics, right? We root for our, the kids from our hometown and people that sense of we made it from here. If anyone from your hometown ever became famous in a band or an actor, everyone from that hometown Support gravitates them. to, right? It's that same idea. So whether it is your race, your creed, your color, your sexual orientation, you know, I remember after the 2014 NFL draft, there was a kid named Michael Sam. He was the co-SEC Defensive Player of the Year. Yep. He got drafted third from last, 250, it was whatever. a pity pick. It, some, some said it was a pity pick, but, you know, the Rams liked him as a player. A lot of people liked him as a player. It was, was he going to be worth what came out? Because he came out, came out of the closet and said, yes, I'm a gay man. So he is a black gay man, which is three times harder in America. If you know anything about black America, it's different in white America as far as open-mindedness. And this is stuff we talk about on ESPN 106 around the home team. The realness of my show is what allowed me to do it for 20 years. Love it. And then I only have to work two hours a day. Well, I'm glad you feel like Media Zone is real enough to bring it up because, Absolutely. you know, it's we're trying to create a place where you can come and talk about anything. I'm here, gonna, you know? Yeah, I'm going to be as, as real and even more so than probably what you want to. Michael Sam had the best-selling jersey of the entire draft. Oh. He never played one down in the NFL. He never played, never made a team. He never played one down. It was practice squad. The Rams, they cut him. Because there were so many people that were so proud mm -hmm. of the fact that he was out living his truth. He didn't even have a number. Yep. They had to use his college number, which belonged to somebody <laughs> else on the Rams. It wasn't him. But it said Sam on the back. So we all connect with. And that's that Venus Serena thing. That's that Tiger Woods thing. That's that Michael Sam thing. You know, Special. everybody wants to... to be you know we all need to belong or feel accepted or welcome to so i don't know how we got to this point but but that's where we are now well, i'm gonna talk real talk boys i gotta hit the can so you keep talking well we can wrap this up let's do I, it I, let's I, wrap I, it up I was gonna we've, say, we've, we've done how much time have i taken of yours i know josh josh cohen could could only talk for maybe like five minutes of his life and then he would <laughs> run out of things to say yeah but i think this is just a sign that we have to bring you back in for another conversation part two baby yeah we'd love to we'd love to continue the conversation awesome thanks for having well, me thank you so much for coming on the palm beach podcast and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon i appreciate it, gentlemen thank you and most of all thank you for the white claw absolutely cheers, cheers. salute cheers